Hello everyone, just as you're hitting like or subscribe wherever you're at, please note that this episode covers challenging topics in mental health, including depression and the life and suicide of Mark Fisher. So just a heads up. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we are doing something fresh on the show by centering on a topic rather than a specific text. We are going to look at imposter syndrome and related phenomena such as depression, feelings of inadequacy, and so on, as a function of social power and social ontology. In other words, what might be the metaphysical and political bases for feeling like a fake? We landed on two texts, which we have all read as a reference for this discussion. They include Deleuze's Plato in the Simulacrum and Mark Fisher's famous blog post, Good for Nothing. We are also joined by Rose, one of our friends on Twitter, whom was highly recommended by Taylor when this episode idea was floated a few weeks ago. Hi, Rose. Thanks for coming on. It's great to be here. It's really great to be here, yeah. Today's show has only a few guiding questions that I hope will spark a very rich discussion. So right off the bat, are any of you feeling like an imposter today? Multiple simulacra at the same time, perhaps. Yeah, I I, I don't ever take the mask off. <laughs> One with the mask, really. I, mean, I don't know who this guy is, Adam, who thinks he's a fucking imposter, but I'll fucking have him if he pretends he is. <laughs> well, here's the first idea that we'll go into. So I'm riffing off of something that's written in Mark Fisher's blog post. I actually will talk about the concept of depression and maybe in conjunction with imposter syndrome, which I, I think are related. So I'm presupposing that in this question. You can, you can attack that later if you'd like. But the question is, what do you think of the idea that depression and or in imposter syndrome and feelings of inadequacy and so forth are best confronted through frames which are impersonal and political? This, this wonderful quote Mark Fisher's talking about, the the second Joy Division record. And he just outright says it. He says, depression is a theory of the world, a theory about the world. And to me, what's at stake in Mark Fisher's work that is unique is the way in which we approach the atomized individual under capital and how they reflect uh, their own subjectivity throughout just the process of existence. And with Fisher, there is this sort of desire uh, to, he sees this sort of desire to break down subjects into sort of individual failures, right? But their successes are the result of the social machinations of capital, but their failures have to be their own. And what that does is that creates sort of an environment where the individual is always uh, separated. So in a sense, understanding where Fisher's coming from when he says that depression shouldn't be looked at as a private failure suffered by private individuals and so on, is attempting to construct a way to view things like depression as informed by the social order around an individual, right? Because y you have to have at least some level of a materialist understanding of maybe not necessarily the unconscious, but of the subject, if you're going to be honest with yourself, right? Uh, the world informs the way in which you feel. Uh, and Fisher argues that these hyper-medicalized notions of the individual can sometimes betray that. Yes. And it's, it's also the, med the medicalization of mental health only works for, is, is only applied partially Right. I mean, it's part of what he writes in Capitalist Realism is right. that right. Um, when the question's asked, what is depression, for example, or anxiety, um, it's understood in, in a certain way as, you know, it, it, it's a lack of hormones and so on in, in various um, sectors of body and so on. I mean, we can fix this through um, helping those catch up through various uh, medicine. Right. Um, but of course, it, the, the, that only applies partially. There's never a question, what is it that produces this particular arrangement in the first place, right? And, and that's where Fisher thinks we need to be thinking in a much more political way about, about, about mental health, because people don't become depressed out of nowhere. It's all, there's always, you know, at least often there's, there's many, you know, reasons for this. And for Fisher, he, he thinks we need to be, we need to understand that it's caused in many ways, not simply by, you know, capitalism causes all the bad things, you know, as in the reductive position, but um, it genuinely produces the structural conditions in which problems of mental health um, 
will flourish. They will. And, and then the treatment is always, um, the same for him. Um, and that, that's part of the, that's part of the issue. And it's why he thinks that the medicalization is only a, a partial medicalization in a way. I guess just to sort of open the ground a bit, just do a little bit more groundwork before we jump into the, the, the politicization of, of post syndrome and mental illness. I just want to run through like this definition. I remember before the show, Craig was asking about potential definitions of imposter syndrome, and maybe we could use this as a bit of a jumping off point as well to develop some of the points um, we've already gone through around politicization. This is a provisional one I come up with. Imposter syndrome is a form of occupational self-doubt that manifests the feeling of lingering guilt and self-judgment. As a subject of the imposter syndrome, you feel that every mode of recognition conveyed upon you by your peers and or your betters, because you know, typically in work situations we end up being quite hard on position, is only ever a false appearance. A mimicry of competence has tricked people into recognizing it as something that is not. In the eyes of the subject of this syndrome, the imposter has no legitimacy to their position because they mimic and repeat the appearance of competence. They are the simulacrum of that which, are, of that which as they are recognized. It's the idea of people recognize me as this thing and I'm actually not this thing. I'm just tr- a magic trick about it. And this, this, is, this is quite a, a powerful position in the sense that you, do, <laughs> you, you can be in very high positions and feel like an imposter because you also sort of sense that you have this amazing power of trickery, which even escapes yourself. But it's also a power of, of self-division. To which I say, if you have imposter syndrome, as many of us, as many of the people do, and as I guess I do to some extent, oh yes, we're totally right. There is no, like, like we're never going to be, rec- we're never going to fully achieve like this pure identification of what we're recognized as. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's to an extent trivial, but whilst it manifests as this, where, this what this is produced from, this is where Fisher goes with it, is that this is actually an internalization of, um, certain social forces as it relates to the, the ideas of how you use yourself in relations of production in employment. This is why it's predominantly an occupational hazard, imposter syndrome, because it's, it's there to sort of push you to, if you, if, if you refuse to recognize yourself as having any resemblance at all to what your position is, it either pushes you to sort of strive towards it, or it pushes you towards simply never asserting yourself. It's a feeling of precarity because there's a precarity of always being possibly found out. You know, there's a sort of a correlation, the rise of imposter syndrome and the rise of precarious labor. Precarious labor, for example, in the very privileged sphere, I guess, of the, of the academy, it's, it's for the people of imposter syndrome because they think maybe I'll get found out and I won't get assigned these, these hours, this class, whatever. And I, yeah, I think it, this way you can sort of illustrate the, the notion of precarity as, as a mental as well as a social uh, reality. I definitely see imposter syndrome as kind of a a um, lack in regards to one fulfilling a kind of social form or technique. I guess I'm I'm very much uh, kind of relating to Thamondon here in that I am me personally. I'm a very personally validated person, as in I make a claim of. I am going to read something, and then I do so. And so through that kind of enunciation and then labor off of that, I, I, and I guess this could be related back to Fisher and how this relates to kind of capitalist inspiration, I guess. In, in this form, I am validated. So through this, the imposter would be someone who, so the imposter can do labor but cannot see themselves as validated through that labor. Mm. Mm-hmm. But the imposter is kind of the anti-capitalist in a way, in that they are they do not feel the satisfaction of the labor of the technic. Maybe my contribution to this discussion would just be to reflect on um, my personal experience. I, I'm I'm guessing I'm the oldest one here, youngest at heart. Uh, absolutely. Um, but in my life, well, at least since the time I graduated college, I've done so many jobs and done so many f- things and, and for a long time felt very lost. And when I reflect upon the feelings that I had at that time, one of the major motivators was the fact that I denied myself to move towards the things to which I was drawn because there was no sense of social competence that would that were derived in any sort of recognizable way in doing those things. One of those things is just doing philosophy. 
And I remember struggling for a long time to ground myself or at least establish myself in the idea that, hey, I can do philosophy either as a vocation or as an avocation. It's part of my life because of all of the voices surrounding me saying, ah, it's kind of worthless, this, that, you can't make any money, there's no utility, blah, 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 you know, and all that chatter kind of stacks up over time. And then I found myself doing a job that I didn't want to do. Now, that repressed desire to do something like philosophy, that wasn't the only thing, but I'm just going to use that in this case. The repressed desire to do philosophy manifested itself in my work as a very active and very obvious resentment that in the way that I did my work, in the way that I presented myself at work, because at that place, I felt like an imposter. I felt like I wasn't real. And a lot of the fantasies that I had were about escaping, moving to another state, setting up a whole other identity, so on and so forth, to the point where I questioned myself and I felt responsible for that. And then when I realized at, at one of the very jobs I was working, I, I discovered I had cancer. And so at that time, I had to go and get treatment for my cancer, which I didn't have money for, and my insurance at the time wasn't covering it either. It was only by dint of the fact that I was able to get a student loan at that time and basically pay cash with a student loan for my cancer yeah. treatment um, by basically borrowing from the system that creates the vision between what it is that I was drawn to as an individual, and the image of social competency that I was struggling to achieve as well, that I was able to get back on, on this other boat, which was, okay, from this point forward, I'm going to do my utmost not to subject myself to this scheme of social competency, this scheme of recognition. And through that, I was able to recover. And then, you know, subsequent to that, I met my wife. I have to say, I have a very rich life now, a lot of great friends. And that just seems so far away from me at that time. You know, it, it, it's great. Like, I, I, I love my life. I, that's not to say there isn't pain and suffering, right? But I understand that struggle so intimately. No, that, that's lovely. I, I think what your story shows is I mean, a, lot of, a lot of psychoanalysts, at least like in the post, like Lacani and traditional go, that's not necessarily about succeeding right the way ego psychology wants you to um it's about failing the right way and to me your story outside of uh just the, the remarkable trajectory that that your life seems to have taken um is you know you're either an optimized imposter or you're an unoptimal imposter yeah. <laughs> and then I, I i think i'd rather be the latter right i think i'd rather be against optimization um you know and we we have all this talk about sort of anti work and and stuff like that and this is where sort of fisher and i think even more radical uh projects like tacun uh, become sort of interlinked here at the level of imposter syndrome because it's only with phenomena like imposter syndrome that these sorts of structures can maintain themselves where your uh, shitty job becomes a privilege right where your own uh, the own your own alienation becomes a means by which you get to distinguish yourself amongst sort of an other that doesn't necessarily exists but you're forced to conjure them up anyway right like the you know like the intern or the low level uh worker having to go through the applications for their job you know it's it's this sort of always perpetuated cycle of understanding that as we reach a point in productivity and development rather than seeing sort of work as uh, an element of uh, social and like uh, economic production under capital that is going to have to fundamentally change. What actually changes is our orientation towards it. Our orientation towards it changes to where participation, uh, work is now a participatory event rather than one that's sort of universal. Um, and I think imposter syndrome sort of uh has that social element to it there um so i guess my goal is going to be like how am i going to be the right imposter <laughs> uh <laughs> this is one of the things that fisher talks about in his um article in, in some depth in is that um it, it, it's this notion of not living up to 
it, no, it's, it's 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 not being the kind of person who should be in this role, right? Um, and that therefore, it must have been some kind of um, you know mistake made or, or whatever, which allowed someone to get there. And one of the things I like is that um, he he does also highlight that this operates on a number of levels because he says um, the form of social power that had most effect on me was class power, although of course gender, race and other forms of oppression work by producing the same sense of ontological inferiority which is best expressed in exactly the thought I articulated above, but one is not the kind of person who can fulfill, fulfill roles which are earmarked for the dominant group. Um, and so for him it's not, it doesn't operate in one, you know, direction it operates on a number of different levels in different ways to different people. Um, but, you know, there is this, one of the strange things is it seems like we, we do seem to have some kind of intuitive sense that um, structural conditions do make an enormous difference to one, one example, you know, would, would be maybe, maybe imposter syndrome, but mental health more broadly, which is that there, there seems to have been some awareness in a strange and often quite reactionary ways, unfortunately, um, at least here in Britain, about the impact of um, long-term lockdowns on mental health. Um, so there has been, in a certain way, some discussion there where people have reached some level of consciousness about the fact that um, these structural conditions can make an enormous difference in determining our, um, you know, the status of our mental health. Um, that conversation hasn't been a particularly good one, unfortunately, for the most part in this country. Um, but it suggests that there's some kind of awareness of this you know, already out there. Yeah, we do it in the United States as well, but we tend to do it at the level of like legislative mechanisms by which we can identify problems, right? So it's not just that how are we producing outcomes? What are we doing to people? Um, it's more in what ways can we sort of identify these already problematized subjects and then make sure that like, they don't, they don't become a broader issue, right? Then this goes all the way back to, to exclusion as a like policy mechanism, right? Um, but at least here, it's, it's almost this, um, uh, this cyclical motion where instead of saying, you know, what role do, do institutions play in making people feel this way? It's, it's in what ways can we identify people who feel this way and thus ensure that they don't, you know, become an issue. Uh, and uh, I think Mark Fisher's essay where he finally ends with the the David uh, Smale, I, I think that, that's the closest, I'm gonna, I probably botched that pronunciation, but the, that, that piece about how, you know, part of, uh, I guess what would be called like the subjectivation of the proletariat or proletarianization has to be presupposed by an understanding that there are entire worlds that if you do enter them, you don't belong there. Um, and I just think that the reason why, and I know some people are going to say like Mark Fisher's piece is mawkish, it's overly sentimental, but like we need to be honest about the way in which these things uh, impact the way in which we see ourselves on sort of the social register. But this also has to be taken seriously, right? Because of the trajectory of Mark Fisher's work um, more broadly. To answer that criticism, too, I mean, I think when we're addressing the idea of imposter syndrome and depression and the kind of alienation that our system produces, my question is, is what is the sort of emotional tonality that follows or the, the, the emotional character of the discourse that follows that? You know, of course it's gushing, of course it's sentimental, right? Because people are so pent up. And then when they finally find the the emotional space to speak about these sort of things, it might not seem cool, but this is part of the process of, of working it out. Yeah, you must always be vulnerable, but you never get to disclose that you're vulnerable, right? Exactly. I just want to expand my initial definition of impulse syndrome a little bit, because I'm talking about it, I start talking about it as an occupational Thing. And it is, but it's not just an occupation in the sense of, you know, uh, high end sort of middle class sort of careers, or even any career, but simply also the spaces that you can occupy. And if 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 we're going to take Fisher to be correct in saying that um, the the, vo the inner voice of imposter syndrome is an internalization of exterior forces that cause you to question yourself and to constantly repeat in a very generic way to give an account of yourself, then we need to think about the real social forces. To call it imposterization that might not necessarily even result in imposter syndrome, but in the resistance against it. So, you know, for example, cert certain groups are constantly called to give a, an account of oneself, even to the ontological level. 
you know, from the Karen asking the person of color, is this your car? Do you, you know, is this your house? Or to the, to, you know, to the fact that for some reason in the bastardized boot licking world of analytic Anglo philosophy at the highest levels, you cannot be a trans person without having to give an ontological account of yourself to the most minute details, which they will cast out because of their, because of the, they, because of their D more Russell fucking version Russell bullshit. Anyway, <laughs> there is a force of imposterization that goes into the heart of our discipline, yet alone the, the fair, you know, not, yet alone, like how many papers you put out. There is a force of social invalidation that tries to impose an ontological hierarchy of recognition throughout the entire system. And that is actually a force of imposterization where people are called to constantly give account of themselves all the time in a game that really is rigged against them. Because fundamentally, the goal is in philosophy as in other uh, forms of, uh, of capitalist social relationships is to tell people that they're not even nothing. You know, Mark Fisher's essay is called Good for Nothing. Really, it's, it's less than nothing because the voice isn't your voice. It's a voice from outside. If you try and speak for yourself, then you know, it's like Zizek's joke about the rich man who's at praying and says, oh, Lord, before you, I am nothing. Middle class man says, Lord, before you, I am nothing. Then the poor guy says, Lord, before you, I am nothing. The rich guy turns to the middle class guy and says, who the fuck is this guy to say he's nothing? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a classic. I, I think, too, what imposter syndrome exposes is that even sort of, and like this is, a, this is part of the problem with like the tradition of like Russell um, and, and onward in, in sort of the more analytic tradition is this assertion that Things like uh, certain elements of, of metaphysics or uh, you know, continental analytic philosophy and so on are not fundamentally political, right? I was reading Dan Smith's response to, to Zizek uh, last night, and Zizek writes in Organs Without Bodies uh, that, you know, DNR and logic ascents are these sort of like uh, super high level works that pay no mind to sort of political ontology. And it's only once like he's infected with Guattari that his works take on sort of a political element. But like, if you can't read a politics into difference and repetition, I, I don't know if I can help you. And that's where all of this comes from, right? It's the ontology gets to determine how and what things belong to the real, right? Imposter syndrome is in a sense, it's sort of feeling as though one is an invalid claimant, right? Um, and and I think that for that very purpose, uh, this sort of disposition towards the sort of ontological history and so on is fundamentally political. I mean, maybe now's a good moment. Go I don't know if I'm a person to introduce for introduce this, but given we part of the reading is, um, you know, Deleuze's, uh, which is not really a paper, it's just a chapter from Logic of Sense, as, um, <laughs> as Adam, I think, pointed out to me earlier, um, about uh, simulacra in Plato. Um, because I, I've always struggled a little bit with this, and I, want, I was sort of hoping to go back and have time to go back and look at a different repetition, but I, I, I didn't have time for that. Um, but my, you know, when I'm looking at this is that Deleuze thinks that um, Plato's idea of, you know, the, the simulacra and the copy versus you know the ideal form. Um, once once he introduces the idea of a simulacra, in the end it all kind of breaks down. That's my reading is that the, all these distinctions end up breaking down, and really you're you're kind of just left with the simulacra. Um, and in, it, maybe this is this is really pithy, but it reminds me of this thing where um, this common thing I'm sure we've we've all heard where. Um, uh, as, as a child, you think adults have all this stuff figured out, and then you become an adult, and you go, "What the hell?" You know, like ha- these guys, these people, like these people, all seem to have it all figured out still, but I don't. And then you realize actually nobody has it figured out, right? <laughs> nobody has all this stuff um, sorted. Right? It's, it's that sort of this sort of casual sort of thing we all, we've all sort of heard about. But maybe that's you know one way of relating back sort of what, what's going, what, how, what we can sort of take on a, on a sort of social level from this, which is that um, you know. There is just simulacra, right? Is that you know that, that's how it relates to imposter syndrome? Is that with the impo- when 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 someone sort of thinks of themselves as this imposter, perhaps part of what's going on there is they're relating themselves to an uh, to an ideal which no one ever really um, fully instantiates or you know participates in, and so on. Right? I think that's precisely the issue. So if you have some sort of transcendent figuration, as you do in the way that Deleuze reads Plato, there are going to be a whole spectrum of folks or objects that are capable of instantiating 
to a certain degree, the figure or form in platonic heaven, if you will. But it's actually the person who's the iconic instantiation of of the form who suffers in what I think is one of the most interesting ways. They suffer in the sense of they are the closest approximation, and hence the first failure of the ideal. And if there's a kind of violence transmitted within the system from, let's say, the highest order instantiations to the lowest order, that comes in virtue of them actually being the first failure. Yeah. One of, one of the interesting ways of reading it is that um, for, for Deleuze, at least Deleuze's reading of Plato, um, the whole point of this, um, this, this program where we kind of uh, distinguish between these different objects, right? Between the one which, which really do participate in the ideal thing and the ones which are, you know, uh, fake, the simulacra, right? Um, the false participants, whatever. Um, is that it's always been about this kind of um, hierarchization of it, right? It's always been about um, trying to distinguish between the real things, the genuine article and the non-inauthentic thing, um, and then grading everything to the degree to which it participates in the ideal, um, which is always, as uh, which Deleuze also points out, is always grounded in myth. Right, um, the, the ideal always comes out of myth, and yet it's also the basis by which we um, grade and hierarchize everything. Um, and so, although the, the straightforward reading of Deleuze's reading here is sort of you know metaphysical and you know ontological in nature, you know when you put it that way, I think it's hard not to see that there's also a really clear social and political um, element at work here, um, which follows on from this, because, you know, Deleuze thinks that it starts with Plato, right? This, the way we think about philosophy and so on starts with Plato, and that's where the root of the problem is. Um, and if that's where the West, you know, in particular, has started its thinking, then maybe that's where we need to be looking. I think you're definitely onto something there, in that um, kind of the Nietzschean a- anti-Platonism is mm. very therapeutic mm, to I kind know. of the... Yeah, in that... Um, we have the ideal and we have ourselves. The question is, in the Dell using kind of, we if we take away both of these things, if we do not see the ideal as kind of ideal or do not see ourselves as something that mm. is not the ideal, it's very therapeutic, or at least in my opinion it is, mm. um, for yeah. my own kind of self. I, I like this idea of like a Dionysian analytic. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I, I agree. I, there, there definitely is a kind of therapeutic element. And I think maybe that's, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not how Nietzsche would want it to be read, but you're right. I mean, this is his entire, entire critique of Plato and his legacy for Nietzsche is that um, it informs and grounds this, this way of understanding the world where we relate ourselves to an unattainable ideal and then internalize guilt as a, response by, um, to, to fail to meet that ideal, right? Um, and so whether you read Nietzsche or Deleuze, you know, f- they seem to have firstly a sort of a certainly similar approach to this, but also you're right, there is a, there's something therapeutic about um, that understanding of the world that, you know, firstly the ideal was never real in the first place, <laughs> in this sense, um, and that it's, it's not only useless but possibly harmful to, um, um, and you know, certainly harmful in many ways to grade and hierarchize and compare, you know, things or even people, of course, you know, in relation to that ideal. Yeah. And I think like, it's that sort of, uh, domino effect where, you know, the, the, the meme where someone's just pushing, I, I hate to do this, but I do it all the time <laughs> it, where someone's pushing over the small domino and it's just this, uh, the notion of the simulacra and the copy. And then it ends with like Mark Fisher, not feeling like an actual patient when in a hospital. Um, because, and, and this is, I think, something that is part of uh, Plato that is fundamentally political and is something that infects all of, uh, I think, all of ancient philosophy post Plato is that even if they try to like particularize and car- compartmentalize in the way that say like Aristotle will with like generations of animals and so on, they're still informing a politics at the level of the ontological, irrespective of whether or not like, I don't know, some dumb transphobe in the UK who's going to win some award for being a, you know, raving bigot. Um, like irrespective of whether or not they re- they re- reject the politics that underlie it, 
it's so obvious to us when we simply experience the way in which we view ourselves, right? And and that's part of the reason why whether it's Deleuze in uh, Anti Oedipus with Guattari or Foucault in the History of Sexuality, this notion of reterritorialization or this notion of subjectivity always comes down to understanding the way in which sort of the ideal subject is formed. Um, and to me, that will always be the, the creation of a centralized notion of a thing will always, by nature of its very definition, force exclusion. And it's those exclusions that create the very like confines of the rule itself, right? It's, it's, it's through exceptions, exclusions, abandonments, and so on that we get a better understanding of what exactly we mean. And even in that state of abandonment, right, even when Mark Fisher's in, you know, the psych ward, as he writes, he doesn't feel like he's a patient. And he doesn't feel as though he's deserving of any sort of treatment or anything like that. So to me, it's just, I, I think these things are just directly linked. And that's why I think it was really smart for, for Craig to, to pull this text out. I really love the idea of a Nietzschean therapy and uh, just trying to imagine what that would look like. I, I want to recall the episode that we did on To Have Done With Judgment, because I think a big part of that has to do with evacuating this global idea of a person, an individual, or what yourself is. I mean, think about all the times that somebody, like if somebody suffers from imposter syndrome, let's say, or just some rarefied standard that they maintain for themselves, uh, the effect of it might you know, it, it invoke a breakdown at some point, and then they're being consoled by a friend, a family member, or a therapist, and say, hey, okay, maybe that's not the ideal that we need to achieve, but here's, here's this, this sort, sort of lower, lower standard, standard over here, here or, or there's, there's this, this other standard, standard or the, the real you. you. Um, right. there's, there's a way in which, which I think we can, can sort of recuperate the, the, the category of categories, the, the, the lots of Platonism, because, because I think what a Nietzschean therapy would involve, and, and, and you kind of get this a little bit in, in Jungian psychology, I mean, to a lesser extent in Freud, but um, going back... Open and wooden sign too. Oh, okay. I'd love to hear more about. Please say more about that after I finish my little rant here. But um, um, the the thing that um, I, I can appreciate about dream therapy, for example, and remember, Deleuze warns us about dreams versus intoxication. Is that the one thing that that dreams and intoxication share is an experience of depersonalization? This sort of like letting down of the ego sensor. This um, activation of intensities that surround or into which the idea of ourself is enmeshed. And it does so in a way that takes us beyond the, the boundaries of how we understand ourselves. The problem is that in the therapeutic environment, therapy can be like a tribunal into which you're just redeposited into a different lot. I think the, the question is, how do we sort of keep the question of depersonalization open so that the, the things like imposter syndrome or uh, divine transcendence, those things can't find the foothold to impose themselves upon the individual. But Rosa, go ahead. I wanted to hear more about the, uh, who, who did you say it was? I, I, did, I still didn't catch it. Wittgenstein. What does Wittgenstein say? He's very much the analytic, the analytic, just the scientific kind of watcher, I guess. I, I don't yeah. know how to really phrase this. But in his kind of handling of philosophy, his notions of um, his therapeutic method of philosophy is the more so bring it to the um, intersubjective kind of reality. Mm. And that I fits in very much though so with the um, Nietzschean or Deleuzean system. Yeah, so he has this therapeutic approach in, in the sense that he, he thinks that a lot of the, a lot of the problems we take to be meaningful problems in philosophy are actually, firstly, they are problems of language, but language is always an intersubjective um, system um, at best, you know, system in quotation marks there. Um, it's always based on context of use, what he calls language games. And so once we realize this, he thinks we'll realize that so many of these problems we run into are actually not really problems at all. Um, in many cases, they're simply um, poor uses of language outside of the context in which they were originally uh, enunciated. Um, and so it's therapeutic in the sense that it, it's meant to um, dissolve the problems rather than to try to posit a clean answer to it. Does that make, that make sense? Yeah, I mean, 
what was that game? I, this is this is it seems like CBT, her. doesn't it? What's that? Sounds a bit CBT, doesn't it? With, with Vic, with yeah, maybe. Hmm. I mean, a little bit. I mean, a little bit. The the, the CBT though, I, I I feel like at least in the way that like we we Americans engage in mostly like that sort of uh, therapeutic approach, or at least like that's the one I've been exposed to. That or you know, um, just basic talk therapy, but. To me, I, what I like about the Wittgenstein example is the uh, what was the, the the language game? The mallet is it the mallet? It's the hammer, right? Where depending on the individual uh, and their exposure to particular contexts, uh, so and social milieu, they will not be able to understand like particular processes in that context. And in a sense, what I like about that is that uh, the reality is everyone's an imposter yeah. all the time. Right, because the, the 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 ground is always moving. Um, and to me, what I like about Deleuze and what always a- attracted me to his work when I was first exposed to it uh, through Foucault in undergrad was that it it read as though. And I, look, I wasn't particularly apt in philosophy. I don't think I am still, but. Yeah, there it is, the imposter <laughs> syndrome yet right. again. <laughs> but but what I appreciated about it was that the difference in Deleuze was not how one ought to live, right? Which is the way in which uh, Plato's entire corpus is oriented around, right? How one ought to think, how one ought to perceive. It's the ways in which one can perceive. It's the way in which one can live. These different modes of being. Um, that sometimes you'll see delineated in even works of like Heidegger and so on, but with Deleuze, it's just an open set. Um, and I, you know, I'm not prescribing some sort of Deleuzean ethic that should then be the the basis upon which you live your life. You do what you want. Um, but I, that, that's to me why I think uh, Fisher's notion of the imposter syndrome and Deleuze's response to to Platonist thought, I think, link well. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you can do what you want, but you can't want what you want. So you should seize the means of wanting. <laughs> what, the hidden Marxist kernel of Deleuze and Guattari. The, the hidden means of subjectivation. Yeah, because yeah. There is, you, there's, there's two responses to imposter syndrome. Either you say, so you try to um, obliterate the very structure of, by which identity fails to reconcile itself with its own recognition. You know these ideal categories, hmm. or you can simply go, "Oh, cool!" And then you sort of enjoy this transgressive kind of creative trickery, and then you can sort of embody this in a sort of slightly more de-alienated way by sort of taking it upon yourself. You know, there's a sort of a way to express the failure of the ideal because the failure of the ideal is always something quite interesting. You know, it, it allows you that your very failure to the ideal is what allows you to. Um, Sort of work within the structures of recognition such that you can produce something different from them. Yeah, it's also what allows you to differentiate and live life as art in the sort of like uh, Foucault Nietzsche sense, right? So you either abolish a structure that leads you towards failures of identity, or you simply fail better at identity and then sort of make it something more malleable and playful. I mean, I, 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 I wait towards one to the to the to the latter side because I think that. You can sort of have a sort of a fundamental plasticity to identity, which is quite fun to play with and transgress in terms of particular identity forms. I don't think we need to abandon the category of identity whatsoever. I just think it's there could be something quite connective in uh, get it's ecstatic, literally, as in getting out of yourself. If we've, the imposter syndrome only maintains itself as a fixed identity, as a, as a phantasm, as, as much Sterner would put it. The cliche for the, the play with transgression of ideal forms would be somebody like Banksy, right? But in, in a therapeutic context, it's interesting because I, I think of the, the idea of active imagination in which, like, if you have a dream or this sort of, um, like, ongoing fantasy that, like, yeah, I don't know, like, I just had this daydream that a wolf just ripped me apart. And then, and then the therapist would say something like, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to put that that wolf in, in, in the room, and I want you to start asking the wolf some questions. And then people will create dialogues. And it's interesting for people who don't believe themselves to have an active imagination. When they start doing something like this, something ecstatic occurs. My thing then is, how far can we go with this? Not just the therapeutic context, not just art.
but how do we do this with social institutions as well? I mean, how many wolves were you talking to? One or several? <laughs> Let's start, oh, let's start come on. As, as you start talking, they're multiplying. Can, can I offer, um, offer a thought here? And then you folks let me know what you think. Um, this is something I, I just, I don't know, I was just thinking about this. Um, because, you know, we, we love to, you know, make things up as you go along on this podcast. Um, <laughs> um, when we read uh, Mr. Le's chapter, um, maybe we can, we can build on this in a certain way to get back to this social and political um side to it and, and maybe maybe the problem is that um starting with plato as sort of you know the, the roots of the western philosophical um canon um this divide between essence and appearance between ideal form copy simulacra etc um wasn't this always a a kind of disciplining apparatus right or at least the background ontological condition for it in the entire western canon because the moment you build this stuff in essence and versus appearance what is the true substance of um uh, of of you know a whole range of things you know um gender race class etc right you know the, the this first distinction between essence and appearance always operates beneath that but then you know on, on on a number of levels this distinction between the ideal form of the copy and the simulacra um once that gets built in alongside it um, as Deleuze says like this the whole point of it was it was never to attain the ideal form it was always to root out the non-ideal right it was always to try and sift between the, the sort of the, the real participants and the fake participants and so maybe part of the problem is that at its sort of roots uh, in sort of Western philosophical tradition, when that gets built in, you know, perhaps it's not a surprise that, you know, Western society has a variety of um, essentialist and bigoted and ignorant <laughs> views about a whole range of um, issues, you know, from race to class to gender and so on and so forth, right? Um, so maybe, maybe that's one way of looking at it is this, you know, either as a kind of, a kind of disciplining apparatus, or at least the conditions which make it possible. This is a point that I've been trying to kind of like uh, put in here. As you mentioned before, uh, gender and race, and these are very kind of in interesting things to this kind of, uh, not dialectic, but kind of discussion that we're having here, the kind of platonic mind. Um, mm. Within gender, obviously, um, not really imposter syndrome, but the expectation, the ideal, um, is very apparent in both trans spaces and cis spaces. This mm -hmm. adherence to the to the social kind of uh, yeah to a social ideal is very important, and then adherence to the bodily ideal, the gendered body ideal, the sex ideal. Yeah, I I think that's right. The ideality of certain identity markers just circulate in the social field. To the extent that the feeling of being an imposter can extend to one's job, one's religion, one's race, one's gender, and I, I don't have an exhaustive list, but Adam, you were talking about the Joe Biden example earlier. Maybe you can bring that up again. So, so, yeah, definitely think, yeah, on the level of the subject, it's hard to have a kind of racial imposter, although there are definitely forces that would try to impose a kind of impostorship. To belonging to a certain category based on, you know, nonsense, nonsensical essentialist stereotypes. Mr. President elect, sir, stop trying to make people act like they're not the race they are because they didn't want to vote for you. That's a force of imposterization. He, he tried it. And also, for example, colorism. It's a form of saying, saying that you're saying that because you know, of your particular skin tone, the person color, you're less of, you're less of this oppressed group. You know, it's, there, is, there are forces of, of impostering, and I think that's where the, the ideal definitely gets to place from the initial sort of purely subjective mode, as this is like my ego ideal kind of thing. I, I very much agree. I mean, I was only sort of uh, riffing there, but I, th I, I guess it relates less to imposter syndrome, more to identity in, in general, which would again link back into Deleuze and sort of fixed identities rather than malleable ones formed by difference in the first place. Imposter syndrome is very much a problem of identity itself. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that this goes back, though, and reverberates throughout Plato, right? You, you know, you don't have to go too far into um, the Republic where you start to see sort of this desire for a cohesive social harmony, right? What, what's the word? Uh, corrupted and incurable souls will have to put an end to themselves, I think is is the line uh, in, in book three of the Republic that always stuck with me, uh, that one always has to be engaged in, at least in this sort of, uh, 
what I think would be a pretty dystopic world of Plato's Republic. Um, one always has to be engaging in sort of a, a taking stock of oneself and recognizing oneself within this broader harmony of, of society as to ensure that they don't despoil it. And part of um, imposter syndrome, I think, is recognizing your role in creating and propelling this social harmony while knowing sort of, or not knowing, but feeling in a sense that your participation in sort of the show of, that is the world, right? If the world is a stage, you're, uh, you are in fact playing a character. Um, and I, that's why in a sense, I think imposter syndrome can be a political tool as well in a way that we can start to break down sort of, um, ideal societies that would be played with undeniable horrors, right? Whether it be Samuel Butler's Erewhon, which does a Guitari ping a few times in Anti-Oedipus, or like Zarathustra's Last Man, right? Where, where the individual who sort of is outside of the social harmony uh, willingly submits themselves to, uh, to an asylum, right? The Last Man is the guy who uh, can uh, say, like, I don't fit in and I'm going to you know, submit myself to, to abandonment for that purpose. So I think uh, for that reason, I, I think that there is a possibility for a productive force at the other side of imposter syndrome. I said, I think, we might, I think the best thing to do is, is distinguish between the objective force, as I've said, of imposterization that calls into question and calls people before judgment as a relation to their own identities and the internal uh, effective disposition generated by uh, those forces and in which one cannot recognize themselves. Because when Fisher talks about the idea of not feeling like a real patient in, in a mental hospital, this is, this is the result of a sustained political campaign, particularly in Britain, in which people who um, have access to public services, particularly a welfare system in the NHS, are constantly questioned as to the reality of their own experiences and the reality of their own pain. Of course, this is just a wider application of the traditional medical bias towards not believing uh, not, not believing the pain of women, for example. This is extended a vast political campaign, which of course is intensified on their end, um, questioning basically anyone who comes to get public services is treated by the British government as a faker, as a potential scrounger. The British public they, they love public services, but they love, they hate the idea more that someone could ever be getting away with getting it off for free. And that's why they take it away from themselves. Repeat. Well, now take away from our people, the people who vote for that tend to be more middle class than that. You are treated as a false claim and a priori and you're called to prove yourself before them. And I think that's why you don't, you don't feel like one because you're not treated like one. You're given it with sort of basis that, oh, there's always the lingering uh, gap consistent in there. And you, you can affirm this gap and say, yes. I don't need to identify with this purely. T I don't need to fit this category of judgment to receive the treatment that I am owed because I, not only says I pay for it, but in the in the lecture, the post capitalist he talks about care without community, unconditional care that people need help. It's unconditional upon upon the judgment. You know, you don't need this sort of thing. Oh, are they really a leftist? With uh, is, is, is some of these like help or something? Are they really leftist? They you know they might have some bad takes something. So, no, they need they need money. They need help. It, there's there's an unconditional act of age that surpasses identity inherent in the notion of affirming apostle syndrome as something universal in a way are you saying the british system is bad <laughs> i mean i'm saying i'm saying the continued existence of the united kingdom is not a left-wing position that's what i'm saying <laughs> um, yeah but when it comes to when it comes to seeing everyone as a potential fraud or treating them as a fraud a priori like what I notice now is like that's literally how the disposition that Socrates approaches every single one of his interlocutors with, and in a oh, sense, yeah. like that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> I would say it's kind of um, the idea of the uh, psychoanalytic giving someone a dream. It is the notion that if you approach everyone as a fraud, they will become a fraud. Mm. If you yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's about mind kind of that area. Yeah. One example that I remember is that um, psychoanalyst starts talking about this one symbols in a dream, and so the patient starts seeing those symbols in a dream. It is the um, kind of the becoming of what is said. Mm. Yeah, like suggestion, essentially. 
Yeah, and then, then then there's a difference between that we get sort of in the archaeology archaeology of knowledge, where it's not that one sees and one enunciates; it's that one sees and then one makes one someone else see, right? Like so, uh, that is the the role of of discursive power, right? That is the very process of of propelling subjectivities, which is why you know. Uh, Adam, you make the joke of seizing the means of subjectivation, right? And that's why those sorts of dispositions are so important. It's not for a any joke. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, and that's why that disposition, when it comes to like, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary projects, that I think is why Adam hits it on the head that recognizing the processes in place that produce subjects, right? The citizen factory is fundamental to any sort of revolutionary politics, particularly within political philosophy. And being careful not to internalize and reproduce that logic by calling out potential allies and comrades and acting in good faith. And that comes with the understanding that even some superficially detestable behavior or words or actions often contain the kernel of good faith in them, even though it might not be apparent. Yeah, no, and, and I think part of those games are like, you're a fraud, you're not a real ally, and so on. It's part of the reason why I think this space can sometimes uh take its toll on people um and uh, yeah i i'm I'm with you there there's kind of this um i wouldn't say ideal technique but it's labor that you have to put forth in order to not be a false claimant yeah yeah no i i I think that's absolutely right i'll I'll admit to being a false claimant whenever when when anyone ever shows me a real one (laughs) Yeah, I, that's why I always return to this notion from Kierkegaard in Sickness Unto Death at the end, where there is this person who, who lives in error, recognizes that they live in error, and they're going to keep living in error to show God that he's a terrible writer, right? That, that, and, and that's the disposition, I think, of the false claimant that is aware they are a false claimant and doesn't give a shit. As soon as you enter into that system of judgment, they've already got you, because they will find a reason. They will yeah, find that's reason. the entirety of the apparatus of capture, right? That, that's where it has to start. It has to start on recognizing particular modes of being as being insufficient or false. So any final thoughts on imposter syndrome or the text? What are you taking away from this discussion? We'll start with Adam first. Well, I'm not really sure I'm qualified to speak on the matter. Um, <laughs> but Terrible joke. Yeah, honestly, honestly uh, just we need to distinguish between the internalized affect of imposter syndrome as a subjective failing to understand oneself as, as the ideal that is apo- imposed on you by outside forces. These outside forces keep calling you to repeat yourself and giving an account of yourself that you are not an imposter, that you're this real thing. It's an entire trap to try and capture you into their own identities, and it is an, abil- is an attempt to impose sort of a fundamental like, ontological hierarchy of essence upon you. Um, these forces of subjectivation exist because they're using them. Seize them. <laughs> Let's break up the British contingent and go to Will. Yeah, I'm going to focus primarily on the good for nothing text, which every time I read it, just it just gets harder to, to get through. Um, it's something that I think everybody can identify with, but at the level of my own personal experience, it's something that I deal with in a sort of uh, non-occupational way. I, I've always dealt with it. Uh, because, and it's something I've come to, to terms with in my life personally, you know, having cerebral palsy, um, you know, uh, there was always this position that I'd felt that, you know, I was insufficiently like a person at the level of the social. There were things like I couldn't do, uh, things I couldn't participate in. But then as I got older and, you know, I started to take disability seriously as sort of a social uh, force i then this was later in my teenage years i felt sort of insufficiently disabled which is a strange sort of cruel position to be in um for yourself and for others uh that i you know i didn't feel as though and that's why the 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 section where he just openly says he didn't feel adequately like a patient uh stuck with me because even in the thing that had tormented me for so long, once I had, had 
sort of reach the other end of it, I felt like I was a fraud on the other side. I felt that at one point I was emulating able-bodiedness. And then once I'd finally circulate, like cir- circled that square or whatever, once I'd come to terms with that, I for a while I felt like I was on the other side of of problem. Um so for me the reason why good for nothing always hits so hard and outside of the context of Mark Fisher um, his life and his work um is just never feeling at home in oneself uh to take yeah. the to take the mm-hmm. Hegelian uh yeah. <laughs> turn but yeah so for me it was just a hard read uh and it gets harder every time <laughs> um but I think it's an important one and I think Fisher as usual is on the money and accessible and so on so read him read more Fisher yeah so in in a way a little bit hard to <laughs> follow that one um I I guess I have thoughts on both both the texts um so the Fisher one I think is as usual really brilliant um and it's it's quite a you know vulnerable piece really where he does talk about it, you know his own mental health and the struggles he's faced um but I think the message I I pull out of it and I I also pull out of much of what he what what he wrote in capitalist realism on the same topic is that we need to think in 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 political and social terms about the um the the, the mental health uh of all of us I suppose right to to, to not simply remain satisfied with saying. Uh, medicalized descriptions of what it involves, but to ask what it, what structural causes produce, um, you know, depression, anxiety, and so on, um, and of course also, you know, imposter syndrome. What, you know, what are the structural forces at work there which um, produce these feelings of inadequacy and so on um, in in many individuals? Um, and so he explores it here, of course, and he explores it in capitalist realism. And I think that's a really important one. One of his main, I think, most, and the most um, resonant. Um, arguments, which still, you know, is with us today. Um, and then on the um, Deleuze sort of side of it, the sort of philosophical side of it, I guess, um, I'm kind of still fixated now on my idea that, like, this is a disciplinary apparatus. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll stay with that uh, or, or think about that later. Um, but I think it's, I think, firstly, it's a really brilliant essay, and I always love reading Deleuze's um, readings of the philosophers. Um, and in particular, the one on Plato, um, I, I tweeted this earlier, but um, I, I stand by this. Um, it, you know, most philosophers, if they wrote just the material that Deleuze wrote about Plato, um, they would be sort of considered a, a major and important sort of um, Plato scholar, right? And, and that's just a footnote to Deleuze. It's like this small thing he does at the very start to get to where he wants to go, which is kind of incredible. Um, and I think there is something there to think about in terms of Deleuze's conviction that um, Plato's philosophy from the start was basically designed to try and root out the false participants in the ideal, right? The ideal is always grounded in myth, and that ideal regulates the um, the conduct of our, of the so-called you know, participants, right, or the ones who don't actually participate. Um, and so you can read that, you know, by itself, you know, med- is on an ontological level, that's really interesting. Um, when you, you know, you can put a social and political gloss on that as well, and I think it still remains really interesting there too. Before I go to Rose, I'll just do my bit very quickly. Um, I really like the idea of reading these texts, the early Deleuze, this particular essay, Difference in Repetition, as a political text. I'm, I'm pretty committed to that idea, uh, especially given we're often confronted with the idea that for example, the Western tradition has brought about the kinds of oppressions that now a majority of, of people experience globally these days. And as philosophers, we interrogate, okay, well, what is it? Is there something inherent to the way that we think the world that then manifests itself in the world of our economy and so forth? And Deleuze really does a fine job here of getting at at a sort of kernel in our thinking, especially right now since I'm rereading Difference and Repetition, you get to see much more of what's happening in this essay played out there in a much more elaborate way. And, you know, we, we often hear the phrase like, oh, a revolutionary way of thinking, to be able to think the idea of difference on its own terms as something not subordinated to identity, that's very difficult to do. The system that, that Deleuze renders on the page is, is unique. And as I said, I'll just come back to this point one more time, that in terms of reevaluating one's politics, 
at the macro and micro level, I think these texts are a fine meditation on that. And so with that, Rose, you get to have the final word. Well, yeah, I think we need to kind of not abandon the ideal and not abandon the false claimant, but just hold them as close to each other and just hold them not as not in hierarchy, but in just normalcy, kind of lived uh, reality. Both of these as kind of non-existent, but valid kind of um, notions of the self, where we can kind of uh, we can work with people and we can kind of erupt the kind of platonic mindset. I want to say thank you again to Rose for joining us on the show today, and thank you for listening wherever you're listening. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or follow us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter. We also have a Patreon account. You can give a nominal donation of about $1 per month if you'd like. Also, coming in February, we are going to have online reading groups for anyone subscribing at the $5 tier and above. So check out our Patreon account. Also, all of us on the show have blogs. Also, we have a merch store. So dive into the show notes if you want to see more. Okay, we'll see you next time.